When I was 13 years old, I was curious what girls looked like. That was the first time I looked at pornography. And over the years, curiosity turned into habit. But I thought, it's all right. Someday I will be married and it won't be a problem anymore. However, years later, when habit turned into addiction, I found out that marriage was not going to fix my addiction. And I kept putting it off that maybe when I fixed the problem, then I would tell people, including my wife. But before then, I couldn't possibly tell anyone the shame I was hiding. One morning, I was in my quiet time with the Lord, and I just felt like He was telling me to tell my wife. I was petrified to tell her. All I could think about was, Will she leave me? But I wanted to be free, so I decided to listen to God and just to tell her the truth. When Zach first told me, I felt like, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? I felt betrayed. Um, those thoughts were just penetrating through my mind. But thankfully, by the grace of God, I did not say those things. I kept them in. But instead, I just said, how can I help you? What can I do to help you? And that is exactly what I needed to hear. For the first time, since I was 13 years old, I felt totally loved and accepted because someone knew the real me, not the me I was pretending to be, still loved me anyways. I feel like that moment when he was honest, it just set our marriage free to be authentic. And um, we, since then, even the little stuff, um, we talk about it, we don't hide it. As uncomfortable maybe we um, we don't hold it in and that was the beginning of my road to recovery to true freedom being authentic with my wife was just the beginning it's been a long road with lots of battles to get to freedom even had to risk and be authentic with warriors, other men that I could share life with. And it's an ongoing battle. But by the grace of God, freedom has came. And I'm closer to my wife, closer to my friends, and closer to God. I'm proud to say it's been eight years since I've looked at pornography. And that is how God has transformed my brokenness into wholeness in Him. And that is my prayer and hope that every man would authentically bring their brokenness to other men so that God can do a miraculous work. I don't know what that brings up in you. But for me, I have to think of, first of all, just admiration for their bravery, their courage in coming forward and saying, this was an issue and this blew up our marriage and God has helped us to heal. And, and we've used this picture of kintsuki, which is a Japanese art of taking a broken piece of pottery and not just jamming it and gluing it back together, but, but of having the, the cracks filled in with gold powder so that it becomes... In fact, a work of art, it becomes something more beautiful and interesting than it was to begin with. And I think of the joy of what Zach and Rachel experience now and the integrity and the honesty of which, which they can now share their story because it's something that they've worked through. And, and that's beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's something that's attractive. But the third thing I think about is just what a mess our world is in.
and the brokenness that exists. Every family, I am sure, has been affected in some way or another by sexuality when it's being handled, not as God intended it, but in whatever the current way that our culture is talking about it. And so we're talking about broken sexuality, and it's an uncomfortable topic. Uh, We did a series back in 2017 called Restoring Sex. We did a whole series on sexuality, and frankly, some people wish we just would not talk about it. But you know, you're you're hearing it from the television, you're hearing it from the newspaper, you're hearing it in the, the movies we watch, you're hearing it in the culture around us, and every women's magazine discusses all these things. And if we don't hear it from God's point of view, then we're getting slowly pushed further and further away from God's plan. And so it's important for us to address it. And I was thinking, what's a good picture of what God's trying to say to us about sexuality? And I thought, let's, let's talk about it as a fire, Because fire, when it's in its right place, is wonderful and light and warming. And fire in the wrong place is totally destructive. And you know, you think of how dangerous it is, and you say, God, what were you thinking when you created sex? I mean, why didn't we just like pollinate, like the flowers, or or some other much less scary way of continuing on in this species? And you know, I'm sure some of you felt like that too. And some churches say, don't talk about it. Some churches say sexuality is just for having children. That's all. Our culture says it's for fun and pleasure. Now that we've solved the pregnancy problem, now that we've solved the being able to come back from the STDs, just whatever two adults want to do is all fine. And the wildfire is burning our culture down. And you think, why does God do this? Why is it? And, and I would say also there's so many people here who've also been damaged by other people's misuse of sexuality. The statistics I read is that one in four women is somehow subject to sexual assault at some point in her life. And I think it's higher than that, honestly. And the statistics on men are somewhat just behind that a little ways. And so you think, what, what is God's plan And in Genesis 2, God gives us the plan. There was one man and one woman, and they were in a covenant love relationship for life, and they were naked and unashamed. And and fire in the right place is wonderful. I don't know about you, but I think a warm shower in the morning is one of the best inventions of modern man. To have a fire in my hot water tank, that's wonderful. To have it in the fireplace, fire does more than just warm you, doesn't it? There, there's never been a better conversation starter than a campfire. And somehow there's that drawing. And it's a good picture that sex is far more than a physical thing. It is to be an emotional response. It's to be a spiritual response. In the right place, fire is wonderful. And in Genesis 2, God says, in fact, Jesus says, I made them and they were naked and unashamed. In fact, he goes on and he says, that's why a man leaves his father and mother. That's the legal part of marriage, where you legally leave your home and create a new home. He's united to his wife. That's the emotional love commitment, covenant. And they become one flesh. That's the sexual component, where it says that in some mysterious way, that joining ties them together. And it's to be a part of their ongoing intimacy together in a marriage. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7 says that couples who were married should not not have sex. It should be a fire that's stoked. And he says in there, were naked and felt no shame. That that was the beautiful, wonderful picture in where it was supposed to be getting something that was a lifetime renewal of that intimacy that we desire. But fire that's not where it belongs is incredibly destructive. We've been living with smoke in the air for quite some time. We had friends that had to leave their house. There was, a, there was a fire down in California started, I think, by a spark from a car that's burned something like 350,000 acres, destroyed about 20 homes. Why? Because only a little bit of fire in the wrong place, and it creates all kinds of destruction. And what kinds of destruction do we see? All around us. There are marriages being broken up as partners cheat. There's the effect of pornography and how it is destroying individual lives, 
fact, I, I saw a new website called Stop the New Drug, and it's actually a secular site against pornography. They're beginning to say, you know what? This is destructive. This is damaging. And so you see the fire outside where it belongs, and it's terribly destructive. I want to read to you a passage from John chapter 8, if you'd open your Bibles. And I'm going to read a story about Jesus dealing with a woman caught in adultery is the name of the, of the passage, or if you have a, a title over it. And I, and I want to first say a caveat. If you're reading a more modern translation, it'll be saying this part of the scripture is not in the earliest manuscripts. And that is true. In fact, it's not in the earliest manuscripts of the book of John. Some of the manuscripts have it in the book of Luke. And there are all kinds of different scholarly debates about where this came from. Personally, I believe that this is a genuine story of Jesus. I think it was told orally, and it was then inserted later. And I think that because, number one, it sounds like Jesus. And number two, what he says here is reinforced in other places in the Scripture. And so we're going to read this from John chapter 8, and it's a picture of a very ugly and emotional scene. So, starting in verse 8, verse 1, they all went home, and Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the whole group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in a, the act of adultery. The law, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and starting to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him and questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older down to the younger, until only Jesus was left. And with the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and leave your life of sin. As I was reading through that, I, I thought, this is often entitled, The Woman Caught in Adultery. But you know what the truth of this story? Is everybody in this story is caught, except Jesus. He's the one they're trying to catch, and he's the one that evades the trap. And they're trying to catch him by using this woman as a pawn. They bring her out, and if you can imagine this picture in your mind, they're in this big temple square. It's the temple where God's dwelling is. It's where they worship God. And he's, Jesus is having a, a, a church service. And all of a sudden, they grab this woman by force, and they bring her right up to the very front. Can you imagine if somebody hauled a woman and grabbed her right here and came up and accused her in front of everybody of adultery and then said, should we kill her right here? It would make things a little awkward, wouldn't you think? And they're demanding an answer from Jesus. And they were trying to trap him. If you understand how this worked, they were trying to find a way to discredit him with the people that were following him. Thousands were following him. And, and this was a power struggle. And this woman was just a pawn. And they were using her in an awful way. And so they were trying to, number one, discredit Jesus. So they said, in the law, Moses said we should stone her. So are we going to follow Moses or not? And if Jesus said, let her go, they could say, see, he's soft on sin, he doesn't really believe the Bible, and they could discredit him that way. If he said, let's stone her right here, they could paint him as aggressive and degrading the woman and somehow being harsh, and they could, they could somehow discredit him that way. So they are, in that moment, trying to create a, a huge pressure and Jesus dodges the whole thing, and he just starts doodling. And what he's doing is he's making everybody think about what they're doing and where they are. It's like you freeze the moment in time, and he takes himself out of the answering right now kind of mode, and he deals with the people that are caught. The woman 
is one person is caught, but we are all caught in this story. And she's caught in sexual sin. And there is all kinds of ways in which sexual sin catches us. We live in a culture where children are being exposed to sexual information at a younger and younger age. So that by the time the parents finally sit down and say, we need to have that talk, the kids are saying, what do you want to know? And why is that so damaging? Because instead of it coming from a careful mindset, instead of it being carefully explained, they're getting it from the locker room, they're getting it from magazines, they're getting it from the internet, and they're getting all kinds of wrong and destructive information. And then couples are jumping into a sexual relationship. Sometimes they start dating, and within two or three weeks, they've gotten involved sexually. And sex is such a powerful thing, it distorts the whole relationship. You can't have those deeper connections of soul to soul and spirit to spirit because it all becomes about the physical because it's such a powerful thing. I remember a teacher when I was in high school, he said, you know, having the hormones that we have as teenagers is like putting a Porsche engine in a Volkswagen body. (laughs) And there's all this drivenness, but it doesn't lead to health. In fact, it's a wonderful way in which to see God as our father. Because as a parent, you tell your kids, eat your vegetables and not the candy. Go to bed. I don't care if it's summer and you're not tired, go to bed. You need to do your homework. Do kids think any of that makes sense? No. They resist it. Why? Because they have no context in which to understand it. And God is a good father. And whenever he gives boundaries, it's to love us, to protect us, and to provide for us. And when we throw those boundaries away, it brings destruction can't tell you how, how many marriages that I've dealt with that are blown up by a cheating on each other. And, and we call it an affair. Doesn't that sound nice and light? Now, the Bible uses harsh words like fornication is sex before marriage, and sex outside of your marriage is adultery. And it's like, ooh, those sound ugly. Let's not talk like that. But that's what God calls it. That's how he sees it. That's how it is. And his desire for us is that we would be pure and that we would enjoy the beauty that he's created. There's a pastor online, and he was talking about this process of learning to love each other that takes time. And he said, you know, I thought we were in puppy love to begin with with my wife. Turns out we were just in heat. (laughs) Because that's not the foundation of love, is it? There is sexual attraction, and it can't be denied, but it's so easy in our culture, and I... I can't tell you how many couples get involved in cheating on each other, and it sometimes starts with a text to just a friend, and then it develops, or a Facebook with an old high school romance, or the, the internet and the pornography that comes in. Oh, you know, people used to have to go to a prostitute district, a red light district. We live in a red light district. It is everywhere around us. And what happens is so many people are caught in adultery. There's a tremendous power in lust. And I think this is really important to say. This is not just about the lure of pornography. The deep desire we have is exactly what Zach said on the the recording. He said, I want to be known and I want to be loved. I want somebody to accept me just like I am and to, to want me and to love me. That's our deepest desire. And listen carefully. The affair, the pornography... The the puppy love all provide this this lie that you can have deep acceptance without the complication of relationship. Are relationships complicated? You should have said that a lot louder. Are relationships complicated? You guys have been married for a while, some of you, right? Yeah. Relationships are complicated, and, and especially pornography gives this message. You can have the acceptance without all the complicated part of relationship. What they tell us is that allure, that pornography actually begins to change your brain. They they talk about it now more like it's a drug than it is having to do with sexuality because the hit on that, that pornography or that flirting or that affair, it creates that dopamine surge in your head that's like a drug. But the problem is, is that lust is not only powerful, lust is destructive. And so that I need more and more and more to give me the same effect. And it needs to be 
more and more graphic and more and more ugly for me to get the same kind of effect. And listen carefully. It also changes your brain to make normal sexuality not exciting enough. Much too complicated for that intimacy. So the danger of it is that it gives a temporary euphoria that's somewhat like drugs, but it doesn't satisfy. Listen, lust never satisfies. Write that down. Lust, by definition, is unsatisfiable. Let me tell you a couple of statistics. The porn industry today in our world is now grossing $97 billion a year. Let me give you a scope. That's more than all professional sports combined. Football, basketball, baseball, all of the money that's made on professional sports is not as much as on pornography. Yeah, I can't remember what the percentage of how many searches on the internet have to do with pornography, but it's an incredible percentage. And besides that, Hollywood makes about 600 movies a year, and they make about $10 billion out of it. Listen, pornography makes 13,000 movies a year, and they gross $15 billion out of this. This is not something happening over in a corner. This is something that is coming more and more and more into our world. And people are being affected at a younger and younger age. And what does the scripture say? It says, the danger of lust is that not only is it unsatisfiable, it corrupts everything. And it says it in 1 Corinthians, flee from sexual immorality. Get up and run. All other sins that a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. That God's intent was for sex to be, listen to this, sacred. It was to be God using this beautiful thing of sexuality in the right place to create a bond between a husband and wife that's ongoing and that a fire that should be stoked. And he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. The scripture is clear that purity is honoring to God and how we use our mind, our eyes, our bodies. He says that's to be something that is to be sacred. And when it's not sacred, it is terribly destructive. And you know, we used to talk about pornography like it was a man's problem. And the statistics go all the way from 50 to 70% of men who are addicted to pornography and 100% who struggle. Women are now dealing with pornography and erotica. Somewhere, they're addicted somewhere in the 40% range. And Fifty Shades of Grey was pornography aimed at women totally to make it acceptable in our culture. And I was amazed at how many people went to the movie and read the book and had it hanging out of their book bag and, and thought this is no big deal. Why? Because the nature of it is it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and it becomes more and more acceptable. And that's the process of the lust if it's left uncontained. The woman was caught in adultery. We're going to come back to how Jesus sends her freedom but you know, if there's somebody missing in this story, you ladies were already ticked about this, weren't you? <laughs> there was a dude involved in the adultery as well, and where is he? Yeah, he, he's caught in his hiddenness. He is hiding. And when they bring this woman up and say she was caught in adultery, every woman there was going, with whom? And I think this is a powerful illustration about how often sexuality has been used to blame the woman for the problem. Where was that guy? I don't know if he was a pawn also. It, it makes me suspicious. You know how hard it would be to catch a couple in the act of adultery? Unless you're setting it up. Unless there's somehow this is pre-planned. And I don't know if he was a co-conspirator or if he was a pawn also, but he's missing here. And I don't think this is the point of the text, but let me just say, I think this is a good point. Somebody on our staff said, you know, he wasn't drug up in front and he wasn't vilified like that woman was, but he also never got to hear Jesus say, neither do I condemn you, go and leave your life of sin. You see, wherever he was before, he still was. He was still caught. And what Zach said, I think, is so true, is we think somehow, oh, this is no big deal, or it's not this one time, or this won't hurt, or I'm not really addicted, or I can just handle it myself. 
And Zach made a great comment. He said, you know, sin grows best in the dark. And when I refused to tell anybody, I kept thinking I could just get on top of this, but there was no honesty, and therefore I kept failing. Zach also remarked, he said, evidently when I'm trying not to cry, I talk slower than I have ever heard anybody talk. Did you notice that? It's because he was trying to keep it together. So there was a guy that was caught in his hiddenness. And I have to tell you in honesty, after we made this recording, there was a lot of discussion on our staff about whether or not we should show it. Because this is raw stuff. And sometimes in church, we have safe sins and not safe sins. It's okay if you had this struggle, but not if you have this struggle. And sometimes we have a two-tier society. These are the project people. These are the people with real problems, and these are the good people. And that leads to a lot of hiddenness, because I don't want to be one of those project people. And then there's a third group there, and they were caught in condemnation. I don't know if you can imagine, but I, I picked some stones up, and these are not pretty stones. These are ugly stones. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know why that was their capital punishment. The whole place is a rock pile. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in that? There was a movie that was made of an Iraqi woman that was stoned for adultery recently. And the movie was so graphic that people got up and walked out. Because you would never forget the sound of a rock crushing into somebody's face. And they were sitting there right in front of this whole group, rock in hand, saying, let's destroy this woman. And you know where they were caught? They were caught in their own smug self-righteousness. They were so caught because they couldn't even see the bigger picture. They were denying this very son of God in front of them. They were trying to find a way to discredit him and eventually kill him. And they were blaming this woman for sexual sin. And who was was guilty of the greater sin? What kinds of people throw rocks? You know, you say, maybe I would never take a big rock that would kill somebody. I'm just going to throw a little pebble. And it's called gossip. Do you know what I heard? You know what they did? You know what happened? You know who throws rocks? There's some categories of people that throw rocks. There are people who are self-righteous. And they think, I'm a good person, particularly if I don't struggle with that sin. Oh, they're an addict, or they're a pervert, or they're whatever names we might use, because that's one sin I don't struggle with. And so we can think of ourselves as better than we should. I think the other group is sometimes people who are guilty of the same sin, and they just feel so guilty and shameful. There was a pastor that did a series I heard of. And he did a series on sex, and he talked about it in such graphic terms, and this is awful, and he talked about in such emotional terms that everybody was like, whoa. And two months later, it came out that he'd been having this affair for six months. And what was he doing? He was vomiting his own shame on everybody else. He was blaming people and trying to deal with his own, shirt, his own hurt. And the third category is, is there are people who have been deeply hurt because their spouse has cheated on him. And it's easy to begin to believe that all, women are, all men are animals and all women are cheaters. And to begin to, to take the hurt that you've never forgiven, as we talked about forgiveness last week, and, and you never release that, and therefore you have this anger inside of you that then comes out sometimes against somebody else who's failing. I think all of us have rocks. The question is, what do you do with them? Who throws stones? All of us have a tendency, whether you are a self-righteous person, whether you feel like you are shameful because you've done the same thing, whether you are angry because something like that's been done to you. And that's the ugly side of it. But freedom comes from Jesus. The only person in this story who is free is Jesus, and he's the only one who can bring freedom. And he does something completely unexpected because only free people can set somebody free. And he kneels down, and while they are bringing all this emotional tension into the room, he totally evades it, and he starts writing. You ever wonder what he wrote? I have an interesting uh, video I watched on a Jewish, he was talking about Jewish culture and how we see it in the scripture, and he said, I wonder if anybody in that crowd thought of Jeremiah 17, 
It said, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame, and those who turn away from you will be written in the dust. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Whoa. What if, what if he was just sitting there writing Joseph, Matthew, Levi, of the people that were standing there with the rocks in their hands? What if he was just writing the name of sins? Because he straightened up. And they said, give us an answer. And he said, okay, I'll give you an answer. The one who is without sin should throw the first stone. You see, in the law of Moses, that was the way it was. It wasn't a lynching like this. It was a trial. But people who came forward and were witnesses had to be so convinced that they were willing to be part of the process. So he said, if you think you're not guilty, then feel free. What a dangerous act. And he, he knelt down to write again in the, in the dust at their feet. Don't you think everybody in the world was watching what he was writing? But they were thinking. And it says they went away from the what? Oldest to the youngest. Older people have had longer to sin. And maybe we've had a few more failures so that we can be a little more compassionate, hopefully. Somebody said, if you're not a radical when you're 20, there's something wrong with your heart. And if you're not a conservative when you're 60, there's something wrong with your head. That you begin to realize that we all fail. And so they started walking away and leaking out. And Jesus turns to the woman who's left standing there. Says, everybody else left from this accusing group, and she still stands there. I think I'd have been out of there. I don't know about you. But she just stood there. And Jesus didn't give her a condemnation. He gave her a challenge. I want you to hear this carefully, because I believe that many of us hear a voice in our mind that is not from the Spirit of God. It's from the evil one. Because the message of condemnation is you are worthless. How could you do that? If people knew what you thought, if people knew what you had done, and all of that message that's condemning, that's not from God. That's from the evil one. He's trying to destroy you. The message of God is conviction. You see, what, Jesus, what does Jesus say? He said, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. But then he says, go now and leave your life of sin. Sometimes people say, well, don't judge me. And what they mean is nobody can say anything is wrong. That's not what Jesus did. He didn't say, there's no sin. This is not a problem. He said, sin's still a big deal. And the answer is not to bring you up here and to publicly stone you. But let me tell you, this is your chance to change. I don't know what your life has been like before this, but this is a chance for you to change. And she heard the message of conviction. And you know the message of conviction is? It's, I love you, and this is damaging to you. Let me cut that tumor out. Let me get rid of that, because you don't have the power to do that. You see, we cannot obey God on our own. Only by the life of Christ in us can we obey God. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you. Leave your life of sin. And there's this impressive moment in the, book, the movie The Passion where after the crowd is gone and Jesus makes this statement, she reaches up and he reaches down and he lifts her to her feet. And you know, there's some speculation that she became part of that group that were disciples of Jesus following him around. And I wonder if when Jesus said, those who love much, those who have forgiven much, love much, if he would be including some people like this woman. You see, his desire was to set her free, not to just condemn her. And I don't know where this all hits you. For some of you, you've been wrestling with pornography or you've been wrestling with sexual sin of some kind. And all the way through it, you've been thinking, I need to talk to somebody. No, I don't want to. I, I can handle this on my own. And I want to challenge you that God still wants to be in the business of setting people free. Some of you have been victims of sexual sin and it's so hard for you to forgive and to rebuild trust and to, to be able to trust anyone. For some of you, you're just angry about the whole process and that bitterness and that hurt is welling up inside of you. For some of you, you've been in a marriage for a long time and you say, I remember when we used to be intimate and we used to have that oneness and we've lost it, and we're just hanging in there for the kids, or we're just doing what's right. And God's desire that his fire would be in every covenant marriage 
and that it would be burning brightly as an example to the culture that says this is how it ought to be instead of the destruction that we see in our culture. Because whether you believe it's sinful or not, it still destroys because God's telling us the truth. So let me give you some suggestions. We have a a series, particularly for guys, called the Conqueror Series. And it's a video series where you get together with other guys and you watch these things together and it gives you a lot of powerful biblical information about how to deal with temptation. And, And it gives you some warrior brothers to stand by you and say, let's deal with this honestly together. Powerful. There's a class that's going to be starting here in Sutherland. Uh, Pastor Craig is leading that, um, and Zach is going to be leading a group that's starting in um, green, and those are on your outline, those uh, classes and the, the email. And then there's a, a good book called Sex, Men, and God by Douglas Weiss, which talks about this whole part, that our sexual nature is a deep part of us, as is, but not as deep as our spiritual nature. And so those are two options and possibilities. But as I said at the beginning, we don't want to pretend this is a problem only for men. It's a problem for women in a couple of ways. Some of you may be struggling with pornography or you've gotten into those romance novels or the erotica and, and it's become that source of secret intimacy for you. And for some of you, your spouse has confessed to you that they struggle, that they've failed, that they've been involved in pornography or they've cheated on you and you've been so overwhelmed with that feeling of unworthiness and of anger. And here's a message from our women's counselor, Shauna. Hi, ladies. My name is Shauna Murphy, and I'm the Renewal Ministries Director here at Family Church. And I wanted to speak to you from the heart for a moment. If anything from today's sermon hit you or touched you deeply, if you were struggling with feelings of betrayal, shame, feeling alone, unloved, or unworthy, I want you to know that you are not alone, and you are loved. Here at Family Church, we want to help you on your journey of healing and recovery. If you would like more information about the resources we have available to you, please contact me. You can email me or call me here at the church office. Thank you. And there's a, also a source book, Christian Woman's Guide to Breaking Free from Pornography. Um, you can order any of these books on Amazon. Um, there's all kinds of resources that are available. But we want to come alongside of you and say the same thing that this passage says, is that wherever you are, however your life has been affected by this fire, Jesus is the one who sets us free. And if we come to him with authenticity, with honesty, with our brokenness, then God says, I am in the business of healing. I will put the gold in the cracks to make something more beautiful. I want to release to the green campus, and Pastor, uh, or actually Jason's going to be walking through that with you down there. Love you guys. Here's your challenge. If you're struggling, you need to ask for help. You cannot handle it alone. Talk to a counselor, talk to a pastor, talk to a friend. Get involved with your life group in a way where you can be honest with somebody. But there, this is a culture-wide fire, and we need good firefighters. We need people who can stand. And so my encouragement is don't pretend that you don't have a problem and don't pretend that you don't need help. And I hope we've given you enough options to look at. And the second thing is put down your stones. You know, literally, they said perhaps we shouldn't show Zach's video because he's in the process of being a director and he is moving towards being a pastor. And when we vote on him as a pastor, some people will never forget that he had a struggle with sexual sin. You see, when people come to church, sometimes they're afraid of judgment, and that's because there's a lot here. It's easy to say, some things Jesus can heal and forgive, some things he can't. And we need to be a church that says, all of us are sinners, and the only place of freedom is in Christ. And we need to believe him for that. So, put down your stones, ask for help. We're going to pray, and then we're going to have a song for us to just process how much we need Jesus. And wherever you're coming from, however this has impacted you, I want you to be thinking about what what your prayer is today. Father, thank you for the freedom that you give, for the beautiful design you had to start with. And God, our culture has destroyed it and our sin nature destroys it. And instead of just sitting when the burned out remains, help us to have the the courage to ask for help and to put your, your commands into our life and your spirit into our hearts. And help us, Father, to have that willingness 
to talk to others and to receive help. And for those, Lord, who tend to be judgmental and critical and think this isn't my issue, help us to put down those stones and to let God, you be the one who sets every one of us free. In Jesus' name, amen. The song we're going to do is called, Lord, I Need You. And I think that's true for every one of us. I don't know how you need him. But as we sing this song, you can either sing along and join in, or you can just listen. I'd encourage you to pray. Pray for whatever's going on in your relationship, in your heart. Maybe you know somebody whose marriage has just gotten blown up, and you need to pray for them. Let this be just a time of reflection as we think about what God's been speaking to us about. Let's sing this together.
God, we've heard truth today from you. We saw the picture of Jesus in compassion in the middle of a sinful, powerful, ugly situation, providing peace and healing. And Father, I pray that you would bring freedom today. For those that have been injured, that you would give them peace and hope. For those who are caught in hiddenness, that you'd give them courage to deal with it. For those couples who've lost the fire of intimacy, that you'd help them to seek each other and to seek you. And that you would help us to be an example to a watching world of how the fire in the right place is a wonderful thing. God, we need you more than we know. In Jesus' name. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.